Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Cad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of organic growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. I want to warn listeners that today's podcast is not about cultivation. I do have some great guests lined up soon for more interviews on growing, but today I want to discuss another important topic. For anyone growing cannabis as a business or working in the cannabis industry, you know that having a great product or growing top shelf cannabis is only half the story. The other half is shaping your message in a way to effectively reach your audience. On that note, I had the pleasure today of interviewing my good friend Shango Los, who has had his feet in both the marketing and cannabis world for a long time now. Shango is the founder of Shaping Fire and the host of the Shaping Fire podcast. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, I highly recommend it. His YouTube channel features exclusive how-to videos and expert interviews. Shango is also the founder of Vimia, the medical cannabis entrepreneur trade group on Vashon Island here in Washington State, where he lives, that is now involved into a patient outreach and educational organization hosting some of the top cannabis speakers in the world. Not to put myself in that category, but I did have the honor of speaking at the Vimeo event, and that video on Living Soil Home Growths can be seen on his YouTube channel. Shango has been working in brand strategy and marketing for 25 years, and since 2013 has been helping cannabis entrepreneurs bring their products to market. Hey Shango, thanks for your time today. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. You know, it's uh, it's kind of fun to have the the, the tables, the, the microphones turned because you've been on my Shaping Fire podcast a couple times, but but now you're interviewing me, so uh, this is this has got some different flavor uh, for it. So uh, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, well, you and I have talked off air quite a bit, and I know you have uh, such a wealth of experience from your uh, previous careers and also everything you've done in and around the cannabis industry. So I'm excited that we'll get the opportunity to interview you and share some of this uh, marketing and branding information with our listeners. Yeah, and it's a little different than your other shows too because <clears throat> I like I enjoy listening to your your podcast and you know it's it's all very scientific and the the idea that we're gonna kind of plug in some marketing information for for people out there that are are bringing some kind of cannabis related product to market I think I think that it's gonna be uh, you know a fun little something different. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, I kind of wanted to start off by giving listeners a little bit of background into who you are and what. Uh, what you're all about. Right on. Cool. So, um, so I guess the, the, the two important things about my background that, that would, would inform our discussion today would be, uh, number one, I've been doing, uh, brand strategy and marketing and what we used to call back in the day in the dot com boom, uh, product evangelism, um, you know, for, you know, over 20 years or so. And, uh, and I was lucky enough, you know, I did the first dot com boom and all of that chaos and investment capital and, and I got to live that experience. And, and at that time, people always said, oh my gosh, to, to be alive and to be an entrepreneur, um, you know, when a whole new industry starts, this is a once in a lifetime thing. And I was very grateful for it. You know, I was in my early twenties and, and I was making more money than I ever had in my life right then. And the funny thing is that once in a lifetime experience <laughs> I'm having again now in cannabis. And, and so I'm very grateful to, you know, be alive in this time and, and to be able to participate. Um, so, but back in the dot com age, you know, or the, or the, the first boom, uh, we were doing lots of tech related stuff and we were doing a lot of brand building and, and, and destroying a lot of companies <laughs> and, uh, and then building some that survived too. So that was great. But, but as far as what we're talking about today, um, uh, uh, I think the most relevance is, is since 2013, I've been helping cannabis-related companies bring their products to market. Um, it all started with, I founded this organization here on Vashon Island, where I live, um, that brought together all the medical growers. So this was, this was pre- uh, uh, taxation and normalization here in Washington state. And, you know, people were getting together and, and I live on this Island and the, and the farmers were just competing against each other, selling against each other on the Island. And so we had very low prices for very high quality flour and value added products like uh, RSO and edibles and things like that. And, and when I kind of realized what was going on, I'm like, Oh my gosh, all you farmers could make so much more money if we got the product 
off the island, if we got it into the dispensaries in other parts of the state. And and since it was legal enough, um, I you know I, I started this this group called Vimia, the Vashon Island Marijuana Entrepreneurs Alliance. And uh, and and I and I know that the word marijuana is not really. Um, yeah, people don't embrace that as much as they did. But in 2013, um, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't understand that cannabis is gonna, was going to be our preferred word. Anyway, so, um, so I pulled together all the far, all the farmers and I said, listen, you know, I can help build these relationships with the dispensaries over town off the island, and then we, if we all work together, we can do things like buy buy uh, soil in bulk and living soil nutrients in bulk and packaging in bulk to bring everybody's costs down and then to bring your profit up. And of course they were all like into this idea. So that's, that's really where I got my start bringing my, you know, the, 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 the brand strategy and marketing and operational stuff that I had been doing in tech into cannabis because um, I myself am a cannabis patient, um, had a, uh, a traumatic brain injury and then, and then started teaching what I knew to, to people here on the Island. And so after helping the growers on the island um, kind of set up this distribution network through the Washington medical system, uh, people started asking me for help with with you know different products, a you know a a soil nutrient or a a you know a specialty you know value added cannabis product, and then and then it's just been continuing on now for for five years or so. I must admit I'm 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 kind of moving away from the consulting. While I'm still available for like products that I think are cool, now that the Shaping Fire podcast is taken off so much and. And, and I'm traveling a lot to do that and to interview people and to speak. I'm not doing nearly as much consulting I'm doing, but um, it doesn't mean that my brain doesn't think about it all the time still. <laughs> yeah, that's great. You know, I've had a lot of discussions about marketing and you've actually helped me with considering how to position uh, or, or look at another podcast that I'm looking at starting and some other stuff. So I've really appreciated your your knowledge and your perspective on things throughout the years. Um, I think it's great. Well, cool, cool. I'm glad I could be helpful. Yeah. So now that we know a little bit about you, um, and I have to say, like, if you meet Chang in person, you would never picture that he was this like tech guy. You know, he uh, <laughs> he you, you feel to me like someone who's been around uh, cannabis your whole life, and uh, yeah, the Vashon Island is just such this amazing place for artists and on and uh, people looking to kind of get away from sort of every, city life yet be pretty close to the city. It's such a cool experience. If, if people ever get a chance to make it out there, I highly recommend it. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really lucky. And actually it was my brain injury that brought me to Vashon. I used to live in Seattle proper. And my, after my brain injury, my neurologist said, you know, if you really want to heal properly, yeah, use the cannabis medicine, but also um, you should move out of town. And so uh, I moved here to Vashon in, in 2011 and that's been pretty great. And, you know, even though I only started really, uh, you know, being involved with cannabis business in 2013, I mean, I've been toking since since college. So, you know, that's like 1989. I got turned on to smoking cannabis. So I've been in cannabis culture and I'm a deadhead, too. Right. So <laughs> I <didn't> know that. <laughs> yeah, I followed the Grateful Dead for a couple years and, you know, I still I still listen to them, you know, weekly. So, you know, I'm an old head. It was kind of funny, too. Uh, recently, this this year. I let my hair grow again because, you know, at the beginning of this more formalized version of cannabis that we're getting into, a lot of the early people, they, you know, they, they wanted to talk to people in suits. They didn't want to trust their millions of dollars to somebody who didn't look like who they were familiar with. So when I started in cannabis, you know, I had my hair a little shorter and when I would speak at conventions, I would wear a suit. And then after a couple of years of that, I realized that um, the kind of people that I attracted in my suit was was different than the people I wanted to work with. So I said, ah, hell. And I just let my hair grow long and feral again. And, and I wear my normal clothes to, and, 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 and everything's still fine. And I'm still making money and people still want to hear my my opinion. So I, I just decided that wearing a suit was a was a, a not not an important variable. Nice. Well, that talks a little bit about your own personal brand and how you wanted to position yourself uh, in the market and be perceived. So uh, I think that's right on topic. But let's uh, let's go ahead and dive in a little bit now about some of the things you and I talked about in terms of branding and marketing. I wanted to, you to be able to give a little bit of a foundation for, say, growers or someone who had a product that was coming out 
in the cannabis industry. Could you give us a little bit of a foundation around uh, best practices and things that would go yeah. along the marketing side? Yeah, for sure. So, so um, I'll I'll take a little uh, module out of a <clears throat> out of a class that I teach, um, and and this is also where I start with all of my consulting clients, just to put us on the on the same page. So, I'll go through um, five categories of of uh, brand strategy, I guess we'll call it, um, that should be considered both by by folks who are are launching a you know a farm or something that's going to produce cannabis itself, but this also works just as well uh, for a non regulated product, whether it be uh, you know bongs and pipes and rolling papers or um, or like like living soil nutrition or something. So. So there's five categories. And the first one is going to be naming. Um, a lot of people, uh, they've got the name that they've been calling their project in their head. And so it's kind of like a default that that's what the name of the business is going to be. Um, but there are some really important things to think about um, when choosing a name. Um, for example, you want to make sure that um, it, you know it's unique in cannabis, right? You want to make sure that there's not already somebody doing that name. Um, also, you want to pick something that uh, is is uh, has got some kind of unique word in it, so that it's easily uh, searchable, right? Uh, you know, if uh, that's why we get a lot of these these companies called like Purple Penguin, right? Because you don't usually get the word purple and the word penguin next to each other. So if somebody Google's Purple Penguin, they come right up. If if you were to call your company, let's say Green Rush, right? One of the most common terms used in cannabis uh, media right now. Um, you know, if you put in Green Rush company, they're not going to find your company, right? There's going to be all of these news articles about the Green Rush, and so um, I, I encourage uh, my, my my clients to to do a little brainstorming to find something that's unique that catches the spirit of how they want to be seen. And 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 you know, in the old days we would do like a whole half day brainstorming workshop, but most folks don't have time or resources to do that. So so I just recommend this this quick little exercise to get you going, which is um, to to brainstorm 50 descriptive words for what you do or sell. And and when you get to probably, you know, somewhere between eight and 12, it's going to start getting hard. And 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 don't give up then, because it's when your brain um, is searching for other words that don't come to mind quickly that you actually stumble across really good names. And so you want to you want to press your mind. You want to make your mind really work for these words. So 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 the first time through, you brainstorm fifty descriptive words for what you do or sell, and then and then the second part of it is that you brainstorm another fifty words that you'd like your customers customers to use to describe you. So now you've got two columns. One column is all about um, you know, what you do, what you're selling, or what your service is. And the other one is descriptors. And then you could just play with that, massage those words back and forth, and, and start to find, well, well, what jumps out to you? What excites you? What combinations of words do you think are cool? And because you've pushed your mind twice, you're going to have a lot of unexpected words that that came to you after you've done your first, you know, 10 or 12. And chances are you're going to find a lot of really interesting, unexpected highways to go down. And then, um, and then with, with all of those resources you have made, mix and match them and, and until you have at least five acceptable names, right? Five names that you think, okay, I could, I could live with this name for a while. Uh, don't just stick with the first one because just because you've gotten one name that is acceptable, um, you know, the, the next one may actually be better and you're going to be, you're going to have this name for a lot of years, hopefully. So you want to make sure that you, you pick a good one. So do your brainstorming exercise, mix and match the words, make five, at least five acceptable names. And then we go to category two, which is social media. So now that you've, you know, got a name for yourself or at least a proposed list of five names, you need to really check your social media because it is going to be forever a pain in the butt 
if if someone else has already got the social media handles that are the name of your company you'll find that you're you're having to do like an underscore in between them or do a weird spelling or man all that stuff really degrades your marketing and so after you've got your list of five acceptable names Number one, go and make sure you can get the domain name. Go make sure you can get the .com for it. Then go check Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and make sure that you can get the your name the same in all of those places. And why this is so important is because, you know, not only you want to be able to tell your customers where to go very easily, but when you start printing up flyers and, and, and printed materials, it's a, it takes up a lot of space to list four or five different social media locations for yourself because you're, you're this on IG, but you're this different thing on Facebook, and then you've got a different domain name. It just gets really confusing. So it's important enough to pick a unique name um, that is unique enough that you can pick it up in all of your social media uh, 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 uniquely. And you know, um, if someone is, is, is sitting on a name that you want to use, say, for example, um, you know, on, on Twitter or something, I mean, domain names are, are, are much more regulated, so it's, it, you can't really grab somebody's domain name. Uh, but for Twitter, for example, I was working with uh, Gontrepreneur.com, and um, somebody had been sitting on the Twitter handle, Gontrepreneur, um, but they hadn't posted anything in two and a half years. And so um, on their behalf, I wrote to Twitter, and I said, hey, you know, this is the, this is our legitimate business name. And and this cat has got this um, this Twitter account that says Gontrepreneur, but he doesn't do anything with it. Right. And he hasn't for years. So how about uh, you consider taking it from him and giving it to us since it's our official business name, Twitter people? And they said, yeah. Right. And so and so I was able to, you know, um, uh, capture that for for Gontrepreneur. So so if you've got a company and and and. You can get the domain name and you can get a couple of the social medias, but you can't get one of them. Know that it is a possibility that you could reach out to them and 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 claim that you've got this business and could potentially um, grab that, that social media. If, if, if somebody's active on it, that's probably way less likely. But if it's neglected, it makes it makes it really easy. All right. So that's the second category. So first one well, is naming. Oh, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to jump in a little bit about naming because I think that's so important and I think people undervalue it as, a, as exactly how much of a priority it is. Um, I can tell you that uh, when we first started my business or I came into my parents' business, it was a compost tea brewing company and our name was Simplicity, but it was dash T-E-A, mm. which from a dot com perspective is really tough. So people had trouble finding the website right away. My parents didn't know anything about tech. Uh, you know, this was back in 2000 when dot coms weren't even really a thing, uh, but it became a big challenge. And uh, as I've looked into naming future businesses and ideas and products and things like that, I've had the opportunity to meet with some really, um, really amazing people on the marketing side. And one of the things that they've they've taught me is sort of take the values that are associated with your product, whatever your product is, whether it's cannabis or cannabis related you know, fertilizer or something and figure out what those values are and then figure out how you can convey them to that audience. And you can do it by making a word association, like creating an association like Apple, for example, or Amazon. There was no association with the company. Um, we They created that. So now when you hear the word Apple, you think of, you know, these technology and an iPhone and and with Amazon, you think of an online an online store. So they they were able to create that association out of nowhere through marketing and branding. Or you can take something. Um, you can try and use the name. I, I love the stuff by Jonah Berger. Have you ever read Contagious? No, I haven't. Oh, it's this awesome book. You can I'll, I'll put a link on the podcast page for people. Um, he has a lot of YouTube talks. The guy's amazing. Um, and one of the things he talks about was he actually came up with the name Swiffer. Uh, which was, you know, they had this mop thing for cleaning dust off of floors. And so they were like, what kind of words sound like when you hear the word Swiffer, what do you think of? You think, well, it sounds like Swift. So it sounds fast. You hear that fuss sound in the middle, which sort of makes you think of like moving a, a mop along the floor. And they used a, a made up word 
that already had associations that you weren't even really aware of in your brain uh, around this product. And they did the same thing with Febreze. And I just thought that was really interesting way of approaching naming um, that was really successful. Yeah, and I love any kind of a name where you can get onomatopoeia like that, where the the name sounds like the the service or device. That's always fun too. It gives a it gives a extra set of of character to your company, and people can put it together. I got two other things to hit on too. That that idea of of making a name like Apple that that doesn't mean anything in technology until you make it say that. That goes for the the same with uh, my podcast, right? Shaping Fire. I mean, that doesn't really mean anything to most people, um, and 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 once people become aware of of both the Shaping Fire podcast and our popular YouTube channel, n- then people are like, oh yeah, you know, I know what Shaping Fire is, but but we have, you know, imbued that instilled meaning into Shaping Fire. What nobody knows, though, is that when I was coming up with it, I did the, I actually did the brainstorming exercises that I had just been just talking about and more, right? I did, you know, my, my naming process took about eight weeks and, uh, and I came up with about 10 names in the end that I liked and it was finally Shaping Fire that I stopped on. And for me, Shaping Fire, the name has always been about, you know, there's this, this normalization, legalization, taxation thing that's taking off and, and cannabis industry has now become this this wildfire and it's chaotic and it's and it's both creating and destroying at the same time and so through good quality education which i i aim to provide both on the podcast and on the youtube channel we are shaping this fire we're and and you know we're, we're, we're sculpting it into something that has meaning and um and so anyway, so that's where I came from. One other thing you were talking about too, you said simplicity, right? And so you're taking a word, uh, simplicity, that is in the dictionary and replacing it with a, something that it's like a, 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 a homonym, like simplicity, T-E-A. And, and I generally suggest people avoid those because uh, they're easy for people to not be able to find you when they search for you. Um, one of my good friends did that recently, and, and he jokes about it all the time when he does interviews. Uh, Patrick from Green Bicycles, uh, he puts together um, a great compost tea. And, um, and, and, and soil amendments, but, but green bicycles is G R E A N. And so, uh, you know, this was a decision he made early on in his process and he's gone with it. And he always jokes about how it's a hassle now to always have to explain people to people that green is not the color green. It's this G R E A N, even though all of his marketing really uses the color green. So, so I, I caution people to, to really focus on words that when people hear it, they will understand how to spell it. That's a great point. That's a really great point. And what's funny is when I, when I heard Shaping Fire, well, one thing I love about that is if you type Shaping Fire into Google, they're going to find you. Yeah. Which yeah, is very, really, really nice. It's, it's very, and very easy intentional. To, <laughs> yeah. And very easy to spell. Everyone can spell the word shaping and the word fire. It's not challenging for someone to spell that. But I thought it was because I was seeing on Instagram, everyone, you know, when someone puts up a, a good bud or flower picture, they always, people would use the fire emoji or say it was fire. So I thought you were using that sort of uh, slang term that had become popular in cannabis culture as a way of saying like shaping fire, like growing top shelf cannabis, Uh, which is interesting because up until now, I didn't realize you had a totally different meaning around your podcast. it certainly wasn't lost on me when I chose the name that it had these multiple meanings in our scene. That's for sure, right? And um, uh, a fire is a word that people in our scene, you know, embrace readily. And it's a good thing. It's a good descriptor. So, I mean, I wouldn't have called the show like, you know, shaping LARF, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you know, I would... I, it, the, the, Having it come together like that uh, was important. Um, but yeah, what was not the uh, initial intent anyway. All right. So talk to me. You were, you were on social media, I think, when I interrupted you there. Yeah. So, so we did naming and we did social media because we want to make sure that your, your, your company is set up to win from the beginning. And then the third one is trademark. And, and I always recommend people to trademark early. As soon as you've decided what your name is really going to be, uh, go ahead and immediately trademark as much as you can. Now, if you, if you are a farm and you are selling 
cannabis, the USPTO will not give you a trademark for selling cannabis. We're still waiting on that to be legally possible. But perhaps you could um, you could start your trademark by trademarking your name and your ability to make t-shirts with it, right? Or your ability to consult with it. And so you start building up this uh, legal history of relationship of you and that name and, and that you're using it publicly. Um, now, if you are in the cannabis industry, but you're in a non-regulated product, say, for example, you know, bongs and rolling papers or, or whatever, you know, something, something that's not regulated by the state, then you can go ahead and, and trademark right away. And, and you should do that right away because there's never been so many people starting cannabis related companies as there are right now. And the chance that, you know, if your company is in Florida, that somebody else in Connecticut is going to come up with the same idea. It's very likely, especially since the lexicon of cannabis words is actually surprisingly small. And so, um, uh, you know, if you, you know, if you're a technical kind of person, you know, certainly you can file your trademark on your own. Um, but I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of having legal help. And, um, you know, you can, you can get into a trademark attorney, you know, for as little as probably 800 bucks to be able to get your initial trademark placed. So it's on the books. And if you're taking this game seriously, spending 800 bucks on a trademark should be probably be considered a reasonable expense to protect your company's identity. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's a, that's a short area trademark, but, but uh, do it swiftly as soon as you have decided on a name. So then the, the next category is, is what I call uh, thin slicing. And, and for, for, for folks who are listening who have grown up with the internet, um, this will be like a duh, but for, but there was a time before the internet. And, and if you were going to open a company, you normally had a storefront. And I think that for most companies, I mean, unless you're, you're opening a retail shop, right? When, so that the whole point is having a storefront, um, I'm a big fan of internet only companies because uh, you don't have to pay the overhead for retail space. You don't have to pay the overhead for the labor. Um, you don't have to deal with um, municipal bans on cannabis companies and, and you get to take advantage of what's called thin slicing because in your, you know, let's say that you live in a small town somewhere and you've got, you've come up with this really cool product. There may only be a couple hundred to a couple thousand people in your immediate area of driving distance who will drive to your store and buy whatever it is that you're selling. But if you're selling it on the internet and now everyone is, you know, pretty comfortable with e-commerce and putting their credit cards online and all that kind of stuff, you get to thin slice the entirety of the country. Whereas locally, there might only be a few people who want your product. If you take the entire country, there's plenty of people to keep your company afloat and doing well. And, um, you know, one of those folks who I think has done a good uh, job of it is uh, Alan Atkinson at uh, at Grokashi, right? Alan does not do a lot of marketing, right? He's he he doesn't do a lot of marketing, uh, and and if if anything, his his biggest marketing is probably um, being the co-founder of the Probiotic Farmers Alliance, and his leadership there tends to lead people to his product, Grokashi. But the thing is, is that there are enough people across the country that hear his message about Grokashi and then can buy it on the line uh, online way more people than there are in Laytonville, even though that's a hotbed of cannabis growing, right? I'm not, I'm certainly not belittling that there's a ton of cannabis being grown there, but there's only so many people in Laytonville. The fact that he's able to thin slice this national market and sell to all those people, he gets to access a nationwide, um, consumer pool without having to have retail shops all across the country. And it works out uh, really well to his, his advantage. So, so consider thin slicing and, and, uh, and, and being an internet company. Uh, and if you, and if you're thinking about owning a retail, opening a retail store, you know, make sure, make sure you are clear in your head that your business model demands that. So then 
uh, similarly, and then this is the this is the last of the five categories is um, start using tech marketing as fast as you can. Uh, for example, um, right away, as soon as as soon as even you have a placeholder on your website uh, before you've even launched, make sure you integrate integrate um, some kind of. Uh, uh, like MailChimp newsletter to capture emails because sometimes people come to your your website once, but they won't ever pl- come again. And so if they come once, it's shown enough interest. And if they're willing to give you their email address, now you can reach them again when you actually go through your product launch and any future product launches, and you can start to develop a, a relationship with them. So so uh, capturing emails with MailChimp, it's it's free. It's very easy to use. Um, and then you can start building customer loyalty programs based on your newsletter and, and, you know, creating original content for that newsletter that, that causes people to share it with their friends. And this is all very low priced marketing that is very valuable when you're just starting out before you're actually creating revenue. Um, and then there are some other really good, uh, high quality tech marketing tools out there like the Facebook pixel, right? I mean, one of the greatest tools that we've got for marketing in cannabis, um, you know, even though Instagram and Facebook make it difficult to ma- to um, market cannabis-related products, if you take your time and you massage your messaging and you don't have pictures of cannabis in your ad, you can actually make it work. And then you boost those and your return on that kind of marketing is, is really good if you take the time to write it in a way that you can kind of disco around their rules. And so then you can use what's called a Facebook pixel and it tracks everybody who, who um, uh, clicks on your ad and go to your website. And so you can remarket to them later. So if you're not familiar with the Facebook pixel, you should look into that. And then there's, there's, there's all sorts of, you know, different technology. One of my favorites is actually called Hot Jar. Um, it's pretty cool. It, it tracks the movement of people on your website. So let's say that you've got an online store and, and you're not getting the, the number of sales that you want for the amount of people who are coming to your site. So let's say that you have a high bounce rate. People come, but they don't buy. Well, it would sure be great to know what they're doing on their on your website while they're there. Maybe they're getting lost. Maybe they don't understand how it works. And so this this service called Hotjar actually records video records everybody who comes to your site. And so you know whenever you want to, you can log in and and watch each user's session and track where they're moving around. It gives you a heat map for the website. And you may find out that that um, people are confusing um, you know, your, your catalog with your shopping cart, or, or maybe they're coming, you're, they're coming to their website and, and you're expecting them to go to the, the store part, but maybe they're going and getting distracted by your blog and your videos and they're spending all their time there and they're forgetting to go back to the store. So, so hot is another great technology too. And, you know, often it's worth it to bring on an expert at this point because, um, you know, if you're in cannabis, chances are you're focused on the operations and horticulture of growing your cannabis. And if you are manufacturing or curating products for sale, that's probably where your expertise is and you're working on that. And, you know, for example, myself even, you know, I know that my tech marketing has to happen, but really what I enjoy most is 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 reaching out to industry experts and then chatting with them and then going to conventions. That's what I like to do. And so, you know, you might want to add somebody who's a specialist. Like like I hired uh, Blunt Branding. And so, you know, I work with Kirsten Nelson at Blunt Branding to sculpt my message. And I'm like, okay, this is what I want to say and this is how I want to say it. And then she'll take it and and plug it into all this kind of the technology and the Facebook pixel. She'll deploy it, and and then and then I can just go back to doing the things that I like to do. Now, granted, bringing somebody on like that, um, you either want to you know you want to make sure you negotiate something that you can afford. Um, uh, dollar wise, but the amount of time that it frees you up uh, is really helpful, especially if you don't know how all this technology crap works in the first place. You know, if this is not your, if you're, this is not your bread and butter, you're going to spend so much time learning the technology. 
um, that you might as well, you know, get somebody at the beginning. So, so those are the five categories that I always start with my, with my clients to, to, you know, brainstorm and get a name, make sure it's available throughout social media and domain, trademark it as soon as you can, um, lean towards a, uh, a thin slicing internet company with less overhead and start using technology marketing apps as soon as possible so that you can uh, uh, track and um, you know, get into relationship with the people who come to you. That's great. I, I agree with everything you just said. And um... I know that you had some company examples to sort of um, highlight some of these principles. Do you want to touch on some of that right now? I know you already mentioned green bicycles uh, for the naming. Was there was there some other things that you had in mind in that regard? Well, sure. I mean, as far as as far as that goes, I mean, there's some folks that do it really well, like um, our mutual friend uh, Jeremy Silva, right, over at Build a Soil. He does a great job about this, right? I mean, he's got he's got a, a unique name that's really easy to say, really easy to spell, and um, he does he does you know. He's creating new content on Instagram all the time. Like, I, you know, I can't be the only one who loves watching him grow. Uh, um, he does like A-B testing with different with different growing supplies in, a, in, in two four by four tents that are in his shop. And, you know, he's creating original content and and people know him as a human, but then they also know his company as curating good uh, products. And so, you know, he's one person that does it really well. Um, can, we, another, can we talk about Jeremy for a second? Because there's a yeah. few things I want to highlight that, that I thought he did a great job on too, is I met Jeremy, uh, you know, digitally in uh, the IC Mag Forum for Organic Soil. I don't even know how long ago. And at this point, I had, I had founded or started Kiss Organics. Build a Soil was, wasn't even around yet. Um, and so we were selling these amendments online, but I was not doing any marketing. And then one day a banner ad for build a soil showed up on the IC Meg forum for organic soil. And he was sponsoring that forum. And that was, you know, people started talking about it. He probably didn't pay that much for the banner, um, in the first place, but he was, he was really a marketing guy. And what he did was he built this idea around amendments by taking the information he was learning on IC Mag and putting it on his website in the blog and sharing the things that people like Clack and Miscoot were saying and, and sharing these recipes and just simplifying the information. So what he did was say, hey, I'm going to give you all this information for free. And a lot of these, these products that this information talks about are going to be available on our website. And the other thing that I think Jeremy did a great job of was he focused on one social media platform and then has been very consistent with it. They have 20 or 30,000 followers now on Instagram. And what he's done there is he's been very consistent about his posting. And it's something that I am terrible at, but rather than him diluting his, his time by posting on Facebook and Instagram or, or these other markets, he's picked the one that he thought was most relevant to growers, uh, which was Instagram. And then has really stuck with it. Uh, like you said, sharing all that information, but he's also created this sort of lifestyle brand around him and his company where it's not all of his posts are not about um, just about cannabis or about product. And there is a lot of stuff that he puts up about his products and deals and that sort of thing. But he also, you know, talks about his girlfriend's hip surgery and the martial arts that he's doing and, and the his his pet pig and other things in his life that make you feel a little more connected to the person and the business that you're you know, you're contributing to. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, the, the whole build of soil brand just screams authenticity, right? I mean, he's the kind of guy when you run into him at Emerald cup or, or locally there in Colorado, you're, you're happy to run into him, not because he's a successful business owner necessarily, but just because he's a nice guy. And, you know, I gotta say that probably, uh, applies uh, equally to, to you, Tad, because, you know, you run a similar type business and, and you also provide a lot of value through your podcast, which then drives traffic to the keep it simple website where you are able to provide these, um, these amendments as well. And I would say also, you are also a likable guy, right? And so I, I would, I would say that the idea of, of, you know, 
not being plasticky corporate and instead kind of like letting that veil between your business and your personal life be a little bit transparent, I think that it creates customer loyalty because, you know, there's a reason why we all push back against like, you know, behemoths with no personality like miracle grow right it's it's because it's it's a bunch of c-suite executives behind it and not some person who you know we'd want to sit down and talk with and and i think that's a, a good thing and sounds like we both agree that that jeremy's done a really good job of that yeah i want to highlight too something that was really tough for me when i first got into business or having a product in in a market was I spent a lot of time noticing other competitors, things they were doing right, things they were doing wrong, information that they were sharing that was just blatantly inaccurate. And I would get really angry and I'd get caught up um, focusing more on them and their product than uh, what I was doing with my own business. And it was totally the wrong approach. Um, since then, I've really learned that a lot of times you can collaborate with people. And realistically, it's important to be aware of what other people are doing in your industry. but it doesn't, it, it doesn't and shouldn't be the focus of your time and your energy. Like Jeremy is probably my biggest online competitor when it comes to selling products. And I'm talking about him on my podcast, but at the same time, I'm also, you know, I've established a, a good working relationship with Jeremy, even though we've never met in person, but we've talked on the phone a lot, you know, we get along great and I wish him the best. And I'm hoping I can collaborate with him in the future because we can only become stronger through these partnerships. It, it doesn't have to be this antagonistic relationship. Um, and you know, like you mentioned green bicycles. Well, we started as a compost tea business. Compost tea is still a big part of our business. Um, but yet I realize there's other people out there that may be doing uh, as good or better job as well um, in, in the industry. So it's, I think it's one of those things we just need to recognize is that uh, we don't have to focus on what other people are doing, but really focus on what we're doing and, and find ways to collaborate with people. Yeah, I think you make two really solid points there. The first one about watching what everybody else is doing. Um, there are so many people doing so many businesses and they do it in um, competitive, combative ways that I would find that I find frustrating and antagonizing that I find when when I. I focus on what everybody else is doing in the industry. I get so upset and stressed out that I have a hard time taking care of my own business. And, and similarly, um, I want to do my podcast and my YouTube channel in my way. And so people are often talking to me like, Hey, did you, you know, listen to this particular podcast or this particular podcast? And people are often surprised when I say, you know, I only really listen to like three or four podcasts, you know, and there, there's probably easily 30 that are popular in, in, um, in cannabis right now, but I don't listen to them all because mostly I'm focused on keeping my head down, taking care of my own business and doing my things the way that I want to, instead of feeling like I need to know what, what, what everybody else is doing to replicate. Um, because normally I don't want to replicate what anybody else is doing anyway. I want to do things in my way. And so I think, I think that's a really good point that you have, uh, to, um, don't worry what everybody else is doing. Like if you want to, if you want to drop in and follow somebody for a little while so that you can learn, you know, some of their secrets and then you can cross apply those secrets to how you're doing business. Like for example, you know, really smart growers go and tour their competitors grows if they can get into them. Right. Right because they can learn best practices from other people and then bring them home to themselves. Now that kind of research and development is really smart, but to, to sit on social media and be obsessing about what other people are doing and, and oh, that, that you'll, you'll, it, that'll just all end in tears. Um, the second point you make about uh, collaborative, you know, I tell my clients that this is something that everybody needs to take from hip hop, right? Because one of the most brilliant marketing things to come out of hip hop is the idea of guesting on somebody's album, right? You can use guesting to either have a, a popular um, artist help build the career of somebody who's just coming up, 
Or you can take two very popular artists and have them guest on a song together. And now they're they're trading audiences, right? So now they're they're both enriched by that partnership. And I think that that is a fantastic example that fits very well uh, in, with cannabis. And I think that you'll we'll be seeing more and more of these co-branded uh, products come out as as the industry gets beyond the the prohibition competitive secretiveness and becomes more open to working together. And you know where I need think that has to happen as soon as possible is within with artisan cannabis growers, the heritage growers. Because because if the heritage farmers, you know, since the one acre cap was removed in California, it's turned into a bloodbath. And the corporations have got the money, the organization, and the experience to just come in and roll out these large marketing programs and inundate the market with uh, brand messaging. But, but the heritage farmers, while they've got better flour, they don't necessarily have the, the messaging reach. And so as artisan growers can come together and work together and, and get their messages out as, as a group on why heritage farming and why small farms are important and why, um, you know, growing in living soils is, is, you know, preferable for a good tasting artisan flower. I mean, more power to them. You know, one, one farm in California that's doing a great job with that is, uh, Moontime Medicinals. And so, you know, uh, their website, um, you know, they, they, you know, it's pretty, right? So, so, so that's number one. It's nice to be there. Number two, they know how to talk about the importance of artisan, um, you know, farming heritage farmers. And, and, you know, they are, they're, they're legit. They're on the Hill in Garberville. I mean, being in Humboldt County, that's, that's pretty legit. And they've been doing it, uh, for decades. Um, and then, um, and the fact that, you know, they, they, they know how to talk about, all right, so we use KNF, we use inputs from our um, own property, uh, we grow in the sunshine, and this is why you should care about that. So, um, you know, not everybody is into that because a lot of the, yet, because a lot of the heritage farmers have never really need to mar- needed to market in that way, but they will get up to speed. And, um, and, if, and if they don't, it's going to be a lot harder road. Yeah, you brought up another good point too, which is sort of what message are you looking to put out there? You have to be, uh, I think, very conscious of what what you want your brand, what values you want your brand to promote, and then make sure that you're consistent across your social media posts to promote that branding. So, you know, for example, if you're going to be a high end craft cannabis company, then your photos need to look high end. You can't put up, you know, crummy photos from a bad, you know, bad phone camera, you actually have to take professional photography photos. And I think too, along that line, there's so many Instagram accounts now, which seems to be the, still the major platform for cannabis. Uh, there's so many Instagram accounts that just have photos of, of buds or, or, you know, wax or whatever rosin, you know, some just photos of the actual product there. It's really boring. Like if I scroll through my Instagram feed, a lot of them are just the same pictures over and over again. So how do you differentiate yourself from all of that? How do you, you know, take unique looking photos or take a different perspective on social media? Or how do you create a message around that and be more than just, you know, bud shots, but actually a lifestyle brand, you know, how do you create that? And I think that's really important that people think about that when they start thinking about their social media. It actually requires a little bit of thought. Hey guys, I'm pausing this podcast here as the end of the first part of my interview with Shango. I'll be sharing the second half of this interview next week. Stay tuned. Again, that was Shango Lose, host of the Shaping Fire podcast. I posted the information and links we discussed in this podcast right on the podcast page at www.kisorganics.com. Just click on the podcast menu on the top of the home screen. And don't forget to sign up for our newsletter on our website right on the home page and subscribe on your favorite listening platform so you can stay up to date with all the latest information and podcasts right when they come out. Thanks for listening.